Hello, welcome to The Armin Show, where we talk about everything science, human behavior, creativity, and more. Thanks for joining, and make sure to subscribe. Ilana, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you doing? I am super duper, and I am glad to be speaking with you today on this right here, Fragmented, A Doctor's Quest to Piece Together American Healthcare books are wonderful and my name is in the book a-r-m-e-n so armin is in oh yeah (laughs) totally unintentional but nice pickup (laughs) how would you describe your background slash path to where you are today what are some key features that come to your mind when you think of how you ended up where you are currently so i wear two hats I'm a practicing physician at Stanford Medicine, and I've been practicing medicine for almost a decade now. Um, I trained in both internal medicine as well as oncology and hematology, and I have a primary care practice where I primarily focus in uh, with patients who have a history of cancer, um, providing comprehensive care for individuals who um, have survived cancer or are currently living with cancer. And at the same time, I've been a science and medical journalist also for almost a decade. So when I was in college, I was interested both in the sciences and the humanities. And I knew I wanted to go to med school. I knew I wanted to become a physician, but I had this itch to write as well. And uh, over the, you know, the last 10 years, I've been freelancing, writing columns, and this is my first book. How cool is that? As I tend to showcase, it's super cool to have a book. It's a piece you've created. It's a substantial item. You can't do it casually. It takes a lot of effort. Very few people are able to do it. So we applaud such an item, which is cool. Now, you have the interest in creating writing and content. Maybe some other doctors do not. What separates you in that capacity? Is it personality traits? What's the quality that lends itself to that? That lends itself to creating content? Yeah, I mean, I've always written because, well, I've written because I've been on the inside of something where I feel like I'm very privileged that I have a front row seat to uh, profound human suffering, as well as systems that work together to take care of those people um, when they're suffering. And I've tried to use my insider um, responsibility um, responsibly. And so I want to write about things and I've always tried to write about things where I have a unique vantage point where I can observe and make arguments um, based on my my primary career, which is being a physician. And in terms of writing this book and writing other articles, um, usually they came from something that I just couldn't get out of my head. If there was a topic that was percolating for quite some time and I've never really seen it written about before, Uh, That was always my motivation, that I had to be the one to put it down into writing, organize my thoughts uh, about the topic, because when it's percolating in your head, it's, you know, just percolating in your head, and hopefully organize it for other people so that they can learn something, they can be informed about about science and medicine, um, you know, in a way that, again, showcases an insider perspective. How important is it to do that thing that speaks to you at that moment versus maybe what should be done or what looks like it should be done? Well, I've always followed my gut when it came to writing. Um, So, I mean, to be fair, it wasn't just in the moment. It's not like this book came in a second and I wrote that topic down on a napkin and, you know, that was it from there. But if I couldn't get it out of my head, um, like I said, and I kept thinking about it for quite some time, And it spoke to me. If the topic spoke to me, I trust my gut enough to um, hope that it speaks to other people. And so that is usually the inner guidance that I follow when it comes to writing. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get into some of the material from the book. American Healthcare, it's fragmented, it's in pieces. What would you rate American Healthcare right now from 1 to 10 if you had just a number to throw at it before we get into that. Like what would the number be of what it could be versus where it's at? 10 is like ideal, one is completely no good. I'd say it's, I'd say it's a five. Um, you know, the book is not all doom and gloom. Uh, I think, you know, you've read a copy of it. 
it's very optimistic as well. Uh, there's a lot that goes well in American healthcare. We have amazing innovations in terms of treating diseases that we were not able to treat previously, curing people of diseases that were previously considered incurable, and some really amazing people go into medicine and my colleagues among them. And I feel very lucky and fortunate that I work with such amazing people who are so dedicated to helping others in need. And so there's a lot that American healthcare does well. However, um, I make the case in my book that the root cause of why the system does not work is that it is fragmented. And by that, I mean a patient's narrative is splintered into discrete pieces by design with no clear beginning, middle, and end. And as a result of that, uh, hardworking, good people, good doctors are forced to work partially blindfolded and make life and death decisions when they don't have all the relevant information at hand. And at the same time, because of this fragmentation, patients and loved ones are forced to navigate an administrative maze when they should be focused on sickness and healing. So it affects everybody in the system. As a doctor, what is an example you can bring of how a patient will come to you and pieces will be missing and you have to work with what is? What's the first one that comes to mind there? Oh my God, there's so many examples because I mean, this is literally the reality that I live in every day. You know, I go to clinic, I see 15 to 16 patients a day and I write in the book that when I meet a new patient, it's like opening a book to page 200 and being asked to write page 201. But maybe on top of that, you know, made pages 50 to 75 are ripped out, 90 to 100 are out of order and everything else is shuffled. Um, so I can uh, share an example. The first chapter of my book um, was about a patient I cared for during my residency who was an elderly veteran um, that I cared for at the VA. And he ended up coming into the hospital and bouncing back multiple times because every time we discharged him and he transferred to a nursing facility, details of his medical care got lost in the shuffle. And so the first time he came back in, um, it was because uh, details about his insulin administration uh, were not carried forward from what we had done during the hospitalization. And he came back in with a blood sugar level that was extremely, extremely elevated. The second time he came back in, it was because he was so dehydrated because free water that he was supposed to be getting through his tube feeds was not being given at the nursing facility the way that we had spelled out in the hospitalization as well. And so when I cared for this patient, um, you know, I tried to make all the details of his medical history clear so that every time he would see a new provider, they would know his history and know what to do next. And it would be based on something. And that unfortunately didn't happen. How much can you do from your end if the back end is already missing a lot of pieces? Is there that much that you can fill in as a doctor? I think that's a really, really insightful question. And I dedicate a lot of time in the book to, to working through that. Um, like I said, I think people who go into medicine are good people. They are hardworking people. They are dedicated people. We go into medicine for a reason. And it's often propelled by this moral compass of doing the right thing for people. And that moral compass gets very challenged when you work in a fundamentally fragmented system where you are set up to fail, um, essentially. Um, you were set up to fail in multiple ways. You were set up to fail when you don't have relevant medical information um, at your fingertips that would help you make good decisions about, about patient care. Um, you were set up to fail when you can't see a patient in follow-up, uh, when you see them one time and just try to accomplish everything in one visit because you don't know when you're ever going to see them again. And it, it's like they just go out and you don't know what's going to happen next. And as individuals, you know, there are, there are things that we can do in this, in this broken system. Um, and I write in the book about that tension, about doing your best and trying to overcome fragmentation and going above and beyond, um, even when you might not be paid to do that and you don't get time to do that. And you know, this, this is a tension because I'm not going to advocate for a system where that 
that exacerbates what we're already doing, essentially, which is doctors doing tons of unpaid time going above and beyond, you know, spending their off hours faxing or sleuthing through charts. Um, you know, I take hours of work home with me every day. When I'm done seeing patients at 5 p.m., I typically have about three to four hours at night of work. And that is work of putting the pieces of patient stories together that I wasn't able to accomplish during the day. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem that doctors like me are working three to four hours every day on top of their normal workload. And that's just one example. You know, others might work more than that. And so I am, I am not going to advocate for, for more of this unpaid time. I think it needs to be built into the system in a more, um, in a, in a meaningful way so that doctors and other healthcare providers can actually accomplish these tasks. And these tasks are bought out and paid for so that we can use the time we have to put the patient's story together. How did the scenario end up in this way? What happens behind the scenes or financially or what impetus causes this that it ended up like it now because maybe it was not like this early on in medicine? So I think there's a couple relevant time points here. So one was in 2009, uh, the High Tech Act that was legislation that was authorized and funded by Congress that stimulated the conversion of paper charts in medicine to electronic charts. And I would, I will say very clearly, that was a good thing. Um, paper charts were uh, carried their own set of enormous problems, as you can imagine. If you're trying to read a chart and you literally can't read the other doctor's handwriting, um, yeah, seriously. So <laughs> talk about missing information. Um, and so in theory, this was a wonderful idea. This was a force for good. In practice, what happened was that there were there was legislation to convert um, you know, paper charts into electronic charts, but there wasn't similar legislation to make sure all of those systems connected with each other and communicated with each other in a meaningful way. So what happened in practicality is that there were hundreds of different electronic vendors, each with their own way of storing data and, and patients' uh, medical narratives, and these often went unshared. And then in addition to that, um, not only do they go unshared, that the charts, most of the charts were fundamentally designed for billing rather than patient care. And so the way that health data was input into these charts was also in a very scattered, fragmented way that doesn't tell a patient's narrative and again, a meaningful way for physicians to use and make decisions on. So that was one, um, was the conversion of paper charts to electronic records that that led to all of these unintended consequences when there wasn't a similar effort to make sure that they were integrated, that that data was put in meaningfully, and that they could connect to one another. I would say the other really relevant piece has to do with how we finance medicine and how we pay for encounters with patients. And I read in the book, um, there's a chapter called Reinventing Primary Care. And it's about how the vast majority of, of medicine and primary care um, still operates according to a fee-for-service model. What does fee-for-service mean? Um, you get paid for doing a service. What is a service? A service is something like a round of chemotherapy, a joint injection, or a patient visit. That is a service. So doctors are compensated for face-to-face -face visits with patients, meaning that everything else that goes into patient care that's not face-to-face -face visits is uncompensated. So that includes communication between a doctor and another doctor, like communication between specialists. Um, it includes messages that are sent to patients. It includes the time that you spend getting the full story, getting the outside faxes, flipping through them, trying to put the pieces together. It includes clicking through all the electronic tabs, again, trying to put the pieces of a, of a patient's story together. It includes writing up that story, um, you know, and charting it as a note. And so, for example, in, in, in my job, I actually consider myself very lucky that I get 30 minutes per patient. There are practices where primary care doctors get 10 to 15 minutes per patient, but that 30 minutes includes everything. It includes the face-to-face -face visit and then trying to squeeze in all of these other tasks that are necessary for good medical care, but are currently uncompensated time. 
And as a result of that, that is why doctors are taking home hours of work every night. Um, the system has not prioritized putting the pieces together as an important part of medical care that requires time and compensation. And as a result, all of us, doctors, patients, and their families, um, have these huge burdens saddled upon them that they we we just do in our off time. Why has there not or why is there not more of a link between doctors and primary care individuals and the people who fund or the finances those individuals? Why is there not as much of a direct link like this is what we need? These are things that match our existence. It seems like there is a gap between what they would like to provide and what would make sense for these individuals to be fully satisfied. I think there is a movement towards newer models, of newer payment models that are more holistic. And so there is a model called value-based care that we are hopefully shifting more towards, which is these visits, you're, you're paid, basically doctors and healthcare organizations are paid based on value. They're ba paid based on the holistic picture and patient outcomes rather than just these, these fragments, a patient visit, um, you know, a joint injection, a round of chemotherapy. And so there are many, many smart people working on changing these payment models um, towards more holistic ones that actually focus on what the patient needs and patient outcomes. But change is very slow. Our healthcare system has congealed over time into what we have now. And it is really hard to revamp something like this from scratch. And so while there are people working on it, um, and there are some healthcare organizations that have gone to different, different models, and there are also healthcare organizations that are working on better integrating the technology, um, it's, it's hard to do it on a nationwide level when we have just really become set in our ways. Whenever I see something, I always relate things to relationships. So in some ways, I see this sort of like if you saw somebody once every four months and that would be a fragmented relationship, you would catch up with them. It would be like moments of punctuated equilibrium where, OK, a lot. OK, we figured it out, things that are happening. And then you would disappear from them for a while. That can't be that strong of a relationship because three months went by and there wasn't continuous checking and feedback and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's very sharp and staccato versus full which is what you are describing there, like holistic and almost continuous in a way, is the goal to make it more of a continuous, the medical system is with you through the process? Absolutely, that's, that's a perfect way of describing it. So that is what is the foundation of good medical care. Um, good medical care is adapting over time to the situation at hand and following a patient through the ups and downs of their medical trajectory it just doesn't work as a one and done. It doesn't work to see somebody once, prescribe a new med, and then not see them again to see how they're doing on that new med. Not know if it works or if it doesn't work, not be able to adapt to all the nuances that happen when you make changes to somebody's health over time. And so the ideal model is, well, there's a lot in this book about the importance of primary care and having a primary doctor who can be that keeper of your medical story and be with you through the ups and downs of your medical trajectory. Um, but again, what that primary doctor needs for this to work is the technology also needs to work and the communication with other members of the team needs to work. And that, that is the foundation. That continuous relationship is absolutely the foundation. You know, I can tell you on a personal level that uh, when I when I see patients once a month compared to the patients on my I have some patients on my panel that I see once a year and then I have some patients on my panel who are more medically complex and I schedule visits with them once a month and what I can do when I see somebody once a month is it's it's just night and day um, I can make little changes over time and um, I don't need to do everything up front. I don't need to make major changes and then not know what happens to them. Um, I can tinker. I can tinker and I can make inc incremental progress in somebody's health. And I try to do that as much as I can, um, but within the confines of the system that we have now, which is that I'm often still m missing data. And sometimes I can't see someone in a relevant period of follow-up. It seems so off. It's sort of like if I told somebody, 
at the beginning of the year to map out the stock purchases. They're going to do it throughout the year for their stocks account and when it'll purchase on February and then April. It may work out great, but the amount of predictive nature and sort of good luck, you got this on your own, is so high that the chance of it a year from now being that, oh, it worked out great throughout the year. What kind of super predictive ability does one have? And then there's pieces like issues come up along the way. Oh, I didn't take my medication as much as I thought I would. And then you want to adjust. Adjustment is a big part of like adaptability is a big part of our being as people. So it's almost like it puts you in a scenario where you're expected to be like beyond evolution, beyond the mm -hmm. future. So a bit of exactly, a exactly. It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to see somebody want a medically complex person one time, and by one time, I mean maybe during a hospitalization, but then you can't see them in the clinic once they're discharged from the hospital. There's so much that changes over time that, med again, good medical care means adapting to the situation at hand. And you can't predict all of these things up front. Um, you can't predict these things a la carte. You have to be able to follow up. And if you can't follow up, things are gonna go through the, things are gonna fall through the cracks, things are gonna go wrong in people's health. And we need that continuous relationship in order to be able to provide medical care the way it was intended to be provided. On the patient's end, do they notice that this is happening? Do they mention anything related to um, their treatment, how often it is, things that are missing? Do they take notice of this? How do they respond? I think patients who have dealt with chronic illness are are now very knowledgeable about the fragmented state of healthcare. Um, my patients who are more medically complex have taken it upon themselves to shoulder their, the details and the nuances of their medical story because they get it. They get that every time they see a new provider, they might not know their full story. They get that when they see a new provider, even if they have access to all their records, they might not have the time to read all of their records so that it's not written in a way that is, that is easy um, to understand. And so my patients who are more medically complex bring me stacks of papers. They bring me their records. Sometimes they create their own short forms uh, with highlights of their medical history. They come prepared and they come prepared because they've lived in the system long enough to understand that what they maybe initially took for granted which is that the system just had all of this. The system had their medical data. The doctors knew their story. They wouldn't have to repeat things over and over. Maybe they took that for granted up front. And just by living in the system long enough, they have realized that that is not at all the case. So they've taken it upon themselves. I think people who are newer to healthcare, um, they will they will have this realization over time, um, but it might not be there just yet. And so I can actually really see that divide um, in my patients, you know, again, the ones who are just very, very entrenched in healthcare have this, um, this intuitive understanding of, of how fragmented it is. And so they take steps to try to compensate for the gaps. That's actually a good one for like an informative one. What would be the top three steps an individual could take to compensate for the current moment of healthcare if they were going to see their doctor? So I would say the first thing you should do is make sure you have your full set of medical records. And so um, in 2021, there was new legislation that was passed, the Cures Act final rule, um, which says that your patient data must be made available to you through electronic patient portals. And so that is supposed to get around, you know, the paper and the faxes, et cetera. But that being said, I think it's also helpful to have that data stored in another way. And so what a patient should do when they have the luxury of time, such as seeing a new doctor in the clinic, is call their previous doctor's offices, or if they're hospitalized, call the medical records department. And you can ask for your full set of medical records to be sent to a new doctor, but I recommend that you get them sent to yourself. And then when you get them sent to yourself, bring them with you to every new doctor's appointment. And that leads to number two, you have to repeat your medical data. And I, I, I think this is unfortunate. Um, you know, again, I'm not advocating that this is the right solution right now. And obviously we need better ways, but 
patients who get frustrated by this and don't want to do it, they will get worse care. And so um, the reality right now, so my second piece of advice would be to get used to repeating your medical stories. And you can even get used to repeating it in a compact, high yield way, like an elevator pitch of your medical data. And the patients who do that do get better care. It's helpful. They can best help their doctors help them. And then the third piece of advice I would strongly suggest is find a primary care doctor who you like and stick with them. Um, and this again, easier said than done. Um, 25% of the population does not have a primary care doctor. There are appointment shortages. Uh, we have general shortages of primary care doctors. There are many, many reasons why people can't get in with a primary doctor, but I strongly recommend people do that and that they do that before they get very sick um, so that your doctor learns your medical history, learns about you and your preferences so that when things change, you have that person in your corner. And you said three, but I'm gonna add one more. I'm gonna add a fourth one. Unbelievable. If, if you can, try to keep your whole team of providers in the same healthcare organization. Again, easier said than done, but let's say you need to see an oncologist, a neurologist, a rheumatologist, and your primary doctor. If possible, if you can have all of your providers within the same healthcare system, it's much easier for them to be able to share records and communicate with each other than if you have this hodgepodge of providers who are in different places that may not necessarily share records. This is a golden set of messages, slightly summarizing because I wrote them. Have your records there, repeat your message. It's kind of like if you have a business, you repeat your elevator pitch because you're getting it out there representing what's your thing. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you're telling somebody about yourself, same thing with your medical record, have that on point. So this is what's happened. This is the story. And so that you can work through it. The only way to work through a story is that it's substantial. And then you can work from that pillar of understanding and then you take it on yourself, which is good. And this one, it's almost like a built individual ability there. And then having the group that is your people that you know, and they know your records and they have sent it to the people that is straightforward and it's smooth and it's not likely something gets lost in uh, miscommunication or had to be faxed later or something like that. It's very efficient, less friction. That makes sense. I mean, I like right. also the, that that is exactly right. And, you know, things can still fall through the cracks, even if you do all of those things. And that's why we just need a better system. And I don't want to put all the onus on individuals saying it is your job when you are very sick to compensate for the gaps of a broken system. But given the realities that we live in now, those are the pieces of advice that I would recommend to best navigate our system as it stands. On the one item you mentioned there, isn't before sick or in a preventative nature, how much, how different is it? What's the, I don't know if it's the question, right? But ratio of uh, ability to treat something prior to it becoming a thing versus after the fact, is there a clear discrepancy between those two? Well, I can't give you a ratio or numbers on this, but there's a lot that we can do preventatively before people get very sick. And again, the people who do that kind of care are primary care doctors. And so in my practice, I see, I, I see the whole range of patients. I see people living with metastatic cancer and I see people who have an early symptom where I'm searching if there could be a potential um, illness that I could catch early and treat early. And so there is a lot that we can do preventatively. And that is why I encourage everybody to, to try to establish with a primary doctor who they trust, who they like, um, whose advice resonates with them so that they can take steps um, to improve their health before catastrophe strikes. One thing I want to go back to is the electronic health records. Uh, so many yeah. years ago, my, my brother was working on that, and which was cool. And now he does IT for a health company, I believe. So that's still cool. But it it went in a direction. It seems like more financial from the early bit. It seems like when there's a new innovation, it tends to be financially fueled. How could the next step uh, where it's value based not be so financially fueled? Is it like take into account kind of like carbon credits where that's taken into account financially? I think what matters the most here is the stakeholders who are at the decision making table. And going back to the High Tech Act, you know, when we converted paper 
charts to electronic charts. Um, you know, there was also legislation called meaningful use, and that was a financial push um, where the government set all these standards for hospitals to receive funding for going electronic. Um, but the people at the decision-making table for what those standards should be were primarily not healthcare providers. They were not people who actually worked in the system. Uh, they were focused on billing. And so all of those metrics that were supposed to improve patient care um, improved how we bill. Um, they didn't really improve patient care and they made doctors' lives a lot harder and they made patients' data a lot more fragmented. And so kind of going back to that as the original sin, um, it was all about who was making these decisions. What are meaningful, actually meaningful metrics in healthcare for sharing data? Um, and what is not meaningful clinically? And you need people who work in healthcare to be able to advise on that so that the system is actually built to satisfy the most important people in it, which are patients, um, and so that doctors can best help them. That's a great point. It would be a hard sell if you went to patients and said, look, the actual health care is somewhat limited, but the billing we're doing great on. So they'd be like, wait a minute, what? what, what? Uh, it's like a little bit off. One thing that comes to mind that's important is that you are speaking on behalf of the category. And when we speak on something, usually we're speaking for more than just us. Do you see yourself speaking on behalf of you and other doctors you know of and other individuals uh, who might not be publicly expressing as much? I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but I do, um, I, I interviewed a lot of people for my book and um, I interviewed a lot of doctors who I cite and quote in the book. And patients are just people that I interact with every single day. And whether I'm formally interviewing someone or not, I've gotten a sense of how patients navigate the system as it stands. And so while I can't say I'm speaking for everyone, you know, these are these are my ideas and not everyone might agree with them. You know, I put forth ideas in the book that are about privacy and transparency that that are bound to provoke disagreement. Um, I'm speaking based on my personal experience. I'm speaking based on practicing medicine in the trenches again for up to a decade. Um, this is the reality that I live. This is not something I was looking at from the outside. This was not a topic that I was searching for. Like, hmm, I wonder if medicine is fragmented. Let me look into it. The topic came to me because it was the reality that I was living. It was standing over fax machines when I should be treating patients. Um, again, it was sleuthing through charts at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night. And so I speak from my personal experience, um, but I do hope I've captured general senses from, from providers as well as patients in my writing. I would say so. On the topic of privacy that you brought up, it makes me think of the current very, uh, very vocal market of data privacy and how it connects to data analysis and maybe artificial intelligence usage for it. Do we, is patient data maintained correctly at this time? Do you think that it should be more accessible for research to be done on it, more kept to the individuals and then like anonymously re represented? What are your views on that category, privacy and data? So I don't think privacy is actually a major issue in healthcare right now. Um, I think it can be an issue that's actually overblown and can impede progress in connecting patient data and records. So there, there have been some vocal, um, there have been people who have been vocal kind of against connecting data between different hospitals because they believe that it um, goes against patient privacy and it goes against HIPAA rules, but it doesn't. Um, so when somebody enters a healthcare facility, when a patient enters a healthcare facility, they are agreeing for people in, directly involved in their care, like their doctors and their nurses and their therapists, to know their medical story and have access to their data. And there are actually plenty of surveys that show that patients are not afraid of their healthcare providers knowing more about them. Um, they're not afraid of, of, of their healthcare providers bringing up something and knowing something in their history that might not be relevant to the situation at hand, like a UTI 10 years ago. They're not afraid of that. Um, all of the data and all of the surveys show that patients 
want their data to be better shared. They want a better system of their providers communicating with each other. And so I think the privacy question can be overblown in this sphere as a way of not connecting data because the assumption is that patients wouldn't want it when in fact all of the data shows that patients do want it. Now the question of third parties is another, is another issue. And so I do write in my book a bit about Google and Google's attempt to get data from, there, there was a Project Nightingale in 2019 where um, Ascension Health, which is the second largest um, healthcare system in the US, shared patient data with Google so that Google can work on creating a better way of connecting data and uh, transmitting it in a meaningful way. But the issue came up with uh, the idea that patients didn't opt in for this. Um, it was just shared without their consent. And so Google argued back saying that, well, all third parties are implicitly involved when patients come into a healthcare facility, such as insurance companies. You don't actually ask consent for every third party that's involved in patient healthcare in some way. Um, and so that is sort of the controversy that we're facing now. Um, I think there are ways for third parties to be involved, like big tech companies, where they do satisfy HIPAA and they do go through kind of the training that healthcare providers go through um, to be able to access information um, in a way that is respectful and does not via violate HIPAA. That is very, very possible. And so uh, I'm hoping we can get to a place where the privacy fears are a little bit, a little bit uh, more muted compared to the benefits that that everybody can get from better sharing data. The tech companies tend to find their way into different scenarios. I once had a lyric in a song I talk about sometimes. Data is the new oil. Uh, Rockefeller would get jealous if he had some zeal. Then Google's overzealous. That was the lyric there. But long live data. What do you see in the next five years as far as potential substantial positives in the category or potential issues if you see something in the next five years? I think it's actually a very positive thing that big tech is getting more involved in this issue. And again, this is something that is very controversial. Not everybody's going to agree with, agree with me on this. But why not involve the people who have the best experience with big data for organizing big data in healthcare? Um, you know, the initial software just was not good. It was not great. And that is why we're in the situation that we're in now. Um, and again, there are ways that this needs to be done. It needs to be done thoughtfully. It needs to be done with attention to privacy and getting patients to consent to this. Um, but I am excited about the possibility that's happening now, which is that big tech companies are um, inserting themselves into healthcare, where previously they have stayed out because of regulatory red tape, and they just didn't want to touch it because healthcare was too complex and there was too much regulation, and uh, they didn't want to touch it. So I'm excited about that possibility. Um, I am excited about the fact that more people recognize that our electronic charts, the way they stand, just aren't working. I think change comes from just that recognition and enough people speaking up about it and sharing their stories of critical pieces of their data going missing when, they're, when they were sick and bad outcomes happening. Um, I think the public is a little bit more informed now that, that the way medical record keep in, keeping occurs um, is kind of a mess. And so I'm excited about that awareness because only when you're aware that something is a major, major problem, like this is not just a footnote in what's broken about American healthcare. It's my belief that this is the root cause of what's broken with American healthcare, that we can begin to bring in the right parties to make meaningful changes. Valid point. I have three last questions on this one. One thing that I usually ask earlier, but it came to my mind, what are a couple of your personality traits that lend yourself to the abilities to do what you do? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think curiosity. Uh, so when I face a problem <laughs> in medicine, that itch to solve it, that itch to learn more, I think helps me actually, has helped me both as, a doctor and a journalist, um, that detective nature of, of just 
it, it bothers me that it's not solved. So I need more information to figure it out. And so, you know, that is what I use on a daily basis in patient care when I'm trying to make a diagnosis. But when it comes to writing and journalism, I feel like that same personality trait um, is at play. And I, I hope, um, you know, lets me write in a way, my intention is that it lets me write in a way that's that's fair and comprehensive and nuanced um, where I can get a whole story and really understand something deeply before I write about it for the public. Sorry, did you ask three personality traits? Uh, just two. Two. All right. So one was curiosity. And the second one will be good old fashioned work ethic. <laughs> um, so writing this book took, I mean, it took two years, uh, like writing the proposal and uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there, you know, people often say that they, they want to write a book. Right. And, um, it's, it's really easy actually to come up with the idea. It's a much hard, it's a much harder thing to implement it. Um, and so good old fashioned work ethic, sticking at something day after day after day until you are happy with the final product. Uh, I, I believe has gotten this book complete. That makes sense. Are there any key people that come to mind that guided you along your way or one individual? that caused the fork in your road that led you to hear? Do any key people come to mind that led you to hear or that you now model some of what you do after? There wasn't one person. I mean, I think I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good role models in medicine. And that goes back to the question you asked earlier about what can we do as individuals in this system? You know, that tension between trying to, trying to do the right thing as an individual when you work in a fundamentally broken system and I think I've been very lucky in my career that I have been surrounded by mentors and colleagues who have modeled this behavior, um, who have modeled going above and beyond for a patient and doing what they can to put the pieces together, even when things are broken. And so just being surrounded by people who have done that has informed how I practice medicine and inspired me to, to write the book. And I would also add, I would say my, my, my biggest inspiration comes from my patients. Um, and they, they inspire me and motivate me. They are the ones who are, their lives are at stake if we don't improve the situation as it stands. And they motivate me by what they do to go above and beyond to advocate for themselves. And they motivate me when they can't do that. And I, and I see people fall through the cracks because they're not able to advocate for themselves in a broken system. And so the people who motivate me the most that, that push me to keep doing this work and that pushed me to write this book were, were my patients. And I hope I did them justice. I hear them in the background. They're all saying she did it. Justice. She did us justice. We're glad about this. They're all cheering. You just can't hear it because it's the audio thing that covers it, but they're all cheering right. in the background. My last, that's funny. My last question is, what would be a takeaway message you would want people to come away with from your book after having read it? The takeaway is that fragmentation or the insertion of gaps into a patient's story by design is the root cause of why American healthcare is not working. This is not an afterthought. This is not a footnote. Um, continuous relationships between doctors and patients and continuous transfer of data is not a luxury, it's crucial. And that is what the foundation of good medical care is. And we need to prioritize some of these logistical barriers as much as medical innovation um, when it comes to treatment. If we have amazing medical innovations in treatment, but the left side doesn't talk to the right, pieces will still fall through the cracks and patients are gonna get bad care. So I would like there to be an equal investment in uh, putting the pieces together of the healthcare system um, compared to medical innovation. Wonderful message there. Dr. Ilana Yorkiewicz, I would like to thank you for having joined on this discussion, describing a bit from this book, as well as your story and informing us about quite a bit in the healthcare domain. Very glad to have spoken with you. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed the discussion. And we are out.
The Armin Show is a culmination of so many of my discussions with thoughtful individuals, knowledgeable individuals, creative individuals, people who have something to say in a category that they have put effort into maybe for years, maybe for decades. A lot of experience comes through. I like finding the links between people and topics of discussion in the categories that you have come to recognize. We're glad to continue the show, to branch out, to expand, to have more links between individuals, to have bigger groupings of individuals together in different formats so that the show becomes more of a show. And as we continue to do this, we're always glad for your support along the way. The Army Show is something that has developed from all my past efforts, blogging, making videos, audios, and has reached to this point where there are now hundreds of episodes with people or just with myself, bringing knowledge, sometimes entertainment, information, something that can help us progress forward in the categories that I tend to cover. Hope you enjoy it, and onward we go. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please comment any takeaways you had, and we'll see you on The Armin Show next time.